We are continuing a series that we are calling Brave, Facing the Giants in Me. And um, we as a church exist to show and share the love of Jesus. We, we, we wanted to figure out what it looks like to put his love on display and to share the message of his gospel with the lost and, and the broken in our world. And we believe that this year, 2019, in unprecedented ways, Jesus is opening doors and inviting us to walk through those doors to carry his light, to carry his love into unique places. And we as a church are saying a collective Yes to that. We want to do that very thing. We want to live and carry out that very mission. We want to get to the end of this year and look back on it and say we owned the year. Not because we didn't mess up, not because we got everything right. We owned the year because we continued to say yes to carrying the love of Jesus through the doors that he is opening for us. But we realize that if we're going to own this year and if we're going to continue to say yes, we're going to need to deal with some of the obstacles within us because oftentimes what keeps us from saying yes to the doors that Jesus opens and the opportunities he gives us to show his love and to share his love, oftentimes it's not obstacles out there somewhere. It's oftentimes obstacles within us. There are things in us that we are wrestling with, that we are dealing with, that keep us from saying yes. And in this series, we want to talk about a few of those obstacles, some of the giants uh, that we all wrestle with, that even in ways we don't realize, keep us from doing the very thing that we were called and created and left on earth to do. And last week, we started by talking about the, the ancient foe, the giant of all giants, the giant of fear, fear. And at this morning, we're going to kind of continue that conversation by talking about fear's nasty cousin, anxiety, um, anxiety. And um, it's something that we all deal with. It's something that we all wrestle through. And it's something that we deal with to different intensities, to different degrees. But it's something we all wrestle with. Through And uh, we're going to look at, at a passage of scripture in Philippians chapter 4. And this morning, we want to talk about what does it look like to start to take steps towards freedom from being owned by anxiety. And we are going to, to talk about what the Bible says about anxiety. And the reason I tell you that is because next week we are going to look at anxiety and fear and depression, but we're going to do it with a little bit of a different lens. We want to talk about the reality of some of the mental health struggles that, that many of us have and, and what does it look like for us to wrestle through it um, in that regard. But this morning we're going to talk about kind of the Bible's words about um, Anxiety, And we're not going to solve the problem of anxiety, but we want to at least start to take steps towards experiencing freedom from anxiety. Um, now, Philippians chapter 4, uh, verse 6. In fact, I'm going to read this uh, verse to you, and then we're going to talk about it uh, a little bit. But here's what it says. Philippians chapter 4, uh, verse 6 says this. Do not... Be anxious about anything. I don't know what your Bible says, but my Bible says right there, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Do not be anxious about anything. Okay, come on, let's be real. Um, it's church, so you can't lie in church. Uh, how many of you have already blown it on this this morning already? Okay, so I, I, let's, I'll talk to us then. Uh, I'll talk to us. The rest of you super spiritual folks, teach us and pray for us in our struggle. Um, do not be anxious about anything. I've already messed that up. This morning, just like it's true every single Sunday, I was a hot mess, a hot mess. Um, I 
I've been struggling with my anxiety issues that I struggle with every single Sunday. It's like, but I have to go and talk in front of these people, and I don't like talking in front of people. You may not know this. I don't like it. What if I say something wrong? What if I mess up? What if people don't like me? What if I swear accidentally while I'm up there? I'm like, and what if I just ruin everything, and then the next thing you know is they'll be boarding the doors, and they'll shut down the church, and I just freak out. I have a moment. I'm not pleasant to be around on a Sunday morning. Um, that's just me. Um, even yesterday, I was watching my daughter play basketball, just a delightful experience, and I was anxious about almost everything. You would think that we were over there negotiating a Middle East peace treaty, um, the anxiety that I was experiencing. Do not be anxious about anything. Not my upcoming final. Sorry to bring that up, but kudos to you college students who are in church on finals week. There will be extra spring break bonus from Jesus for you on that one. But, like, not even my finals, though. Like, not even the job application I'm wearing, waiting to hear back about. Do not be anxious. Not even about the, the, the medical results that are pending. Not about the layoffs that have been happening at work. Be anxious about nothing. We want to talk about that this morning. The, the Bible is such a beautiful book, but one thing that's often true about the Bible is to understand some of what it means often requires a little surgery, a little surgical procedure to, to understand what's behind what the Bible is saying, and this morning is no exception. I think if we're going to start to take steps towards experiencing freedom from anxiety the way God desires us to experience it, we've got to start by understanding this term anxiety, this term anxious. Do not be anxious. It's a really interesting term, and it might surprise you to know that it's a pretty broad and dare I say benign term. It's not loaded with a bunch of moral implications like you would expect um, the word anxious. Um, here in Philippians chapter 4, uh, the word translated anxious is the Greek word mermanao. I went to seminary, by the way. So I can stand up here in front of you all and say the Greek word is, and don't lie, you're super impressed. Um, that I know um, a Greek word that I read in the book this week. But um, <laughs> the, the Greek word is merimanao. And even though the word is translated anxious in this particular passage, the same word could be translated a variety of different ways and is translated a variety of different ways throughout the scripture. Uh, this same word merimanao can be translated as care as care. Uh, this word, uh, merimanao, can sometimes be translated as to consider something. This same word can be translated as concern. Now, I don't know about you, but I geek out over stuff like this, and I actually start to find a little bit of freedom in it because isn't that interesting? It is interesting to me, and now it has to be interesting to you because you're here. Um, but it fascinated me to think that, wait a minute, so the biblical word translated anxious, merimanao, can actually be and oftentimes is, most of the time, is actually a healthy thing. That's helpful to me. Wait a minute, so you're telling me much of the time this word, anxiety, can actually be a healthy and helpful thing, right? I mean, the word care, when the word merimana or anxiety is translated care, it's speaking about to feel and anticipate and meet the need of a person or a situation. I think that's interesting that this word anxiety describes when you see something that needs to be taken care of and you take care of it. Anxiety. 
And you Enneagram type ones know exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, you see a a need before anyone else sees that need, and you put it on your magical to-do list, and then you formulate a plan, and then you deal with it and check that sucker off your list before the rest of us even wake up. And the care that brings about that result is anxiety. It's healthy Anxiety, 1 Corinthians 7, describing spouses whose energies are being channeled in caring well for each other. The word there is anxiety. Did you know that you need some anxiety to serve your spouse well? It's interesting. This healthy anxiety is the word to care. Um, it's, it's how parents keep their children alive, Right? Without anxiety, this word, you would be the scary parent who is like, meh. They'll figure out the whole crossing the road thing by themselves. Like, no, they're two and four. Uh, You might want a little anxiety about that. You might actually want to care about something like that. I live um, with someone who is uh, majors in this regard. This is my wife. She's like, well... We're going to be away from the house for this amount of time, um, and the, 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 um, the, the, the time to snack to tantrum ratio is uh, two to one to zero, and so therefore, we're going to pack this amount of snacks, and I'm like, what time are we leaving? Right? But it is. It is that ability to care for, to anticipate, and then to take care of a person or a situation. Um, the word can also be translated to consider. Um, To consider, right? I mean, that's the idea of intentionally thinking something over. It's the idea of mulling something over. It's how you come up with a plan of action to take care of the thing that you saw that needed to be taken care of. That's healthy anxiety. Without healthy anxiety, we would all just be reactionary. Without healthy anxiety, you're just going to blah, 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 and then think later. You're going to push post before you've mulled over, is this the right and the best course of action for me to take in order to take care of that situation? It is how you come up with a plan. Um, A good business mind is going to have healthy anxiety. Um, If you're going to meet the demands of the market, you've got to formulate a plan. You've got to mull it over and consider how are we going to execute this thing. Anxiety. Um, Concern. If consider is to think something over, then concern is this idea of feeling something over. It's that restlessness that you experience when you know something needs to be taken care of, and if it doesn't get taken care of, it may not end up being an ideal situation. Now, once that thing is checked off your list, you are good to go. But until it's checked off your list, there is just this restlessness that's churning within you. And at this point, that's when many of us would start to say, I'm feeling a little anxious. And we might use the word nervous. Um, But in either case, it's a word that speaks about having a concern for something. It's this low-key bother that happens within us. It's a feeling that makes you double-check to make sure that the child seat is latched. It's that thing that that makes you ask the question, did we turn the stove off? Um... This is my kids and I sometimes like to mess with my wife because she does this. Like every time she leaves the house, she second guesses whether or not she closed the garage door. And so as she drives down the street, she'll get to a certain point where she can see the garage door and she'll do one last look. And so if you want to mess with her, you just like five minutes later, like, are we sure the garage door was closed? It was it? Was it not? Right? What was? And it's that c- concern that emerges in her. I think I just gave my kids some more Um, ideas about how this can be a charming afternoon at the house. Um, This is the thing that makes you set your alarm 
to make sure, is my alarm set because tomorrow is a pretty important thing. This is the thing that says, did I turn in my project? I want to make sure that I turned in my project. In fact, I want to double check and make sure that the person got the project that I turned in. It's how you get ready for finals. Sorry to bring that up again. Um, it's by having concern that I have a final coming up, so I need to do something about it. And that restlessness you feel, that's healthy anxiety, biblically speaking. A person who never experiences anxiety, A, is a liar. But more than that, uh, this is not a spiritual person. This is actually a scary person because the kids don't get picked up from school um, they go to college and they spend thousands of dollars majoring in intramurals. You know, they're like, meh, whatever. They don't do any schoolwork, constantly between jobs. Why? Because they blew off a deadline. They just weren't concerned about it. That's not healthy. Um, and it's interesting that oftentimes it's, it's, it's those folks, and I naturally lean in this direction, let me just confess and be honest with y'all, um, but it's often these folks um, who invent words and use words like worry words. So we'll speak about the, the, the folks who are like, they, they have that restlessness churning in them and that concern and that consideration to take care of things. And, and, and th th then we invent terms <laughs> like, like worry warts, which is interesting because the person who's most likely to use a term worry wart is, what, is the person that I would call a crisis king. See, worry warts, so to speak, they worry in small amounts of things regularly. <laughs> While the crisis kings are like, ha, 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 chill out, chill out. And then the project is due tomorrow morning. Ah! All nighter, you're freaking out. You are losing your mind. Now you've got the third like overdue date due thing. And now you're like, oh my goodness. And it's a crisis. And then the rest of us, we get dragged into your crisis because you procrastinated because you didn't have the healthy amount of anxiety to be concerned enough to put together a plan. I'm just saying, at my house, our house is not burned down because of the healthy anxiety my wife experiences on a regular basis. I praise the Lord for the worry warts who keep this world going around and around and around. Anxiety is healthy if you're actually going to get some things, if you're going to get some things Done. And so I just want to say, by the way, to some of you who've maybe even experienced an ounce of shame by the fact that you tend to maybe lean in the direction of worry, or I guarantee you, you're also the person who keeps everyone else alive, right? We read the Bible and we're like, come on, man, why are you being like Martha right now? If Martha didn't exist, Jesus would never have had a house to go to to have a party for his sister Mary, for her sister Mary to be sitting and listening to Jesus. Right? So there is something that I think sometimes we experience an undue shame because as a church we will use anxiety and we'll lump it all like it's just all bad. But no, the word is actually a natural and can be a helpful thing and some of us need a healthier dose of anxiety in our lives. It may explain why we continue to get ourselves in trouble and why we're maybe a little bit further in debt than we should be because we did not have the healthy amount of concern. I'm getting carried away. Here we go. A simple way to define the word merimanao is being concerned about a future outcome. Biblical anxiety at the Base of it all is just being concerned about a future outcome. Whenever I'm concerned about how something might turn out in the future, I'm anxious. Merimanao, an upcoming game that I'm feeling nervous about. Merimanao, an upcoming deadline at work. Merimanao, right? An upcoming date. I'm going on a date. Merimanao, man, right? Um, that's anxiety. Upcoming spring break trip plans or kids' birthday party. It's something that speaks of being concerned about a future outcome. Um, we all experience it, and much of the time it's a healthy thing. But can we all agree that anxiety can turn on us and become incredibly unhealthy. And when it does, 
Now I'm no longer concerned about a future outcome. No, now I am consumed by a feared outcome that I cannot control. It's no longer just a concern. It's no longer just a low-grade restlessness. It now becomes a consuming sense of a feared outcome. There is something that I don't want to happen, but I'm fixating on that very thing that I don't want to happen, and I cannot control whether or not it actually happens, and that begins to consume me. And in that moment, Merimanao turns Merimah nasty, and it's that nasty giant that God would say, do not be anxious about anything. Do not let anything get to the place where it becomes a feared outcome consuming you that you can't even control. And yet if we're honest, we all get to that place at some time or Another. But when God commands us not to be anxious, he's not saying do not feel any concern. We need to feel concern. He's not saying do not be concerned with future outcomes you can't control. No, there are future outcomes you can't control that you should be concerned about, and it's okay to experience concern about that. He's saying do not let that concern begin to consume you. Do not let that feared outcome own you. Do not let that feared outcome that you cannot control begin to control you. Because if you allow it to start to control you, if you allow it to start to consume you, if you allow it to start to own you, it will take you down. And for many of us, if we're honest, we experience that. For some of us, we are sitting in the room, and that's our reality this morning. But if you allow it to start to control and consume you, it'll become a giant that robs you of the life and the mission that Jesus Christ created and designed you for. And all of a sudden, you become overwhelmed with a terrified restlessness that's fueled by what ifs. But what if? But what if that thing happens, though? But what if it doesn't? Yeah, that, but mainly, what if it does, though? What if my kids are adults and they end up living in a basement somewhere? What if? Why? Because, because they flunked out of school. Why? Because I'm terrible at helping them with their e-learning. And all of that because you saw the forecast that says chances of snow next week. And now you are down this consuming path of my kids are, oh my goodness, what if, right? What if, what if, what if, what if I'm homeless and under a bridge? Why? Because I got a C on my final. Have you even taken the final yet? No, I haven't taken the final yet, but what if I take the final and then I get a C and then, and then, and now you're homeless under a bridge all of a sudden. What if she leaves me? You know what? I know she'll leave me. I know she will leave me. Who? My wife. I I don't even know what I would do when she leaves me. So every day I beg her, please don't leave me. Please don't leave me. Which annoys her a lot, which makes her want to leave me. And so I don't even understand. But I, I, and then all of a sudden you can become fixated on this feared outcome that you can't ultimately control? What if she gets in a a car accident? What if I lose my job and I can't take care of my family? People lose jobs all the time. What if finances run out and we cannot continue this ministry that we felt called to? What if my health fails? I just turned 40, and you remember what happened to mom when she turned 40. But what if not? But yeah, but what if though? And that can begin to grow and can consume. And what happens is I start to live in the present as if that feared what if is a done deal. I start to experience immense fear. I start to experience terror. I start to experience deep um, sorrow. I I find myself sad. I find myself stuck even because of that feared outcome. And in that moment, the giant starts to win. Because man, when anxiety consumes, 
it has a way of stealing your joy because you can't experience joy if you're expecting sorrow. It becomes really difficult to move forward in that way. Um, it, it has a way of quenching love because you can't love now if you're afraid of losing then. And it robs you of today in favor of tomorrow's possible outcomes. It kills generosity because, you know, why would I give much if I fear I'm going to lose it all? Right? It reverses our, our freedom where you can't be free if you're stuck. And you just can't be your best if you're constantly bracing for the worst. And, of course, it stalls Mission, because it's hard to live on mission when you're living on guard. And mission is about openness. Mission is about giving. Mission is about looking to the needs of other people. Now, here's the truth. Again, all of us will be bullied by this giant of anxiety at some point or another. Some of us are sitting in this room and we're experiencing it in a full-fledged way even this morning. Um, that there are feared outcomes that make us feel sick even as we sit here. And they make us feel stuck because they are replaying over and over and over again until we are living like it is going to happen. It's a done deal. And it's that anxiety that God invites us away from. And at the risk of being overly simplistic, and I look forward to next week talking about some of what happens in our body, some of what happens in our brains regarding anxiety and regarding depression, because this topic is so much more complicated and complex than the church often likes to make it. And my dream is that this will be a safe place for those of us who struggle with a variety of disorders or struggle with a variety of mental health issues. Um, and we would see where there is grace for that in the word of God. And I say that again because Paul's approach is not necessarily going to be a clinical one. But there is a spiritual set of steps that we can take to start to counter and to start to fight anxiety. And regardless of whether there are mental health issues at play or not, this is a place that we all want to at least start. And I love what Paul says in taking steps towards experiencing some freedom from anxiety. Uh, verse 6, Philippians chapter 4. Do not be anxious about anything. Do not let anything get you to the point where it becomes this feared outcome that's consuming and controlling you when you can't control the outcome anyway. But, he says, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, again, will never stop experiencing or wrestling with anxiety. Um, but in this passage, Paul gives us some practical steps to experiencing freedom over consuming anxiety. The first thing he says, this is going to blow your minds, okay, just get ready for this. And I know you like, man, I went to church and he said something that I never would have imagined he would say in church in a thousand years. But here's the first thing Paul recommends. Pray. Um, right? Wasn't that like an M. Night Shyamalan ending to Sixth Sense? You're like, what? We didn't see that one coming. Um, <laughs> pray about it, Paul says. This is so simple, and yet it's so powerful. And I love the simplicity of this, that Paul does not overcomplicate what he invites us to. He says, no, pray about it. And the word for pray here is the word that means saying things to God. Saying things to God. Verbally saying things to God. This is such a great word, by the way. When you notice that you're starting to experience concern, and that concern is replaying and replaying and maybe inching towards consuming you, Paul would say, 
Start saying that concern to God. Say it to God. Don't just let it play. Make it a prayer. And I love this, especially for anxiety, because anxiety is often these thoughts that are on a mental playlist, and they're repeating over and over again. And I love that Paul is essentially saying, yeah, it's on your mental playlist. I'm just inviting you to put it on your verbal playlist and say it to God. Like, say it to him. And then the rest of the words Paul is going to use are just going to be other ways of describing um, prayer. And this is so powerful as I process this in my own life and as I process this in, in, in general that so often we're bullied by feared outcomes that we will not name. We think about them over and over and over again and they plague our minds and they haunt us over and over again, but we will not speak them. And for many of us, I wonder if some of the reasons for that are superstitious reasons. Like, yeah, there are these thoughts and these feared outcomes that play over and over in my mind, but I don't want to say them because I fear that if I say them, that I'm going to give them some strange power and they'll become a reality. I feel like if I say them, then the devil will be eavesdropping and then he's going to use those as weapons against me, so I'm not going to say them. For some of us, it's like, if I say them, I'm going to jinx my own life. Like, there's some kind of a magical empowering of my anxiety if I say the words like Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, and so I don't say it. For some of us, it's not superstition, it's shame. It's shame. It's like, I am a grown man, and I'm freaking out that people are not going to like me when I get there. What am I, a child? I should be way beyond this by now, so I can't speak of the thing that is a feared outcome because I feel too mature or too grown or too advanced to be experiencing that, and yet that is the thing that's replaying, but you won't say the thing that's replaying, and, and, and God would say, I'm a father who loves you, and I know it anyway, and I'm the only one who can do something about it anyway. I dare you to say what's replaying in your mind out loud to me, and something begins to break, I believe, when you put words to the thing that you are afraid might happen and you tell it to God. You're not just saying it out in the air. You're not just putting it out on social media for everybody to see, but you are saying to God what it is that's replaying in your mind. I love what Paul invites us to here, and it's time for some of us to start the practice of saying the specific outcome that worries you. And then he says to plead to plead. This is, again, just another word for prayer, but the emphasis is not on saying it as much as it is on staying with it. Say it to God, and then keep on saying it to God, which is why he says in every situation, he's saying there, there's going to be anxiety, and your anxiety is going to be stirred in different situations, and when it's stirred and that concern starts to feel like it's playing over and over and consuming you, in that moment, turn your worry to words and say them to God, and then when it happens again, do it again. And if you're anything like me, I'm the kind of person who's like, I'm sorry, I planted a seed yesterday, and it's not a tree today. I prayed about this two days ago or two months ago. I love this. It's an invitation into a pattern of praying that when I experience anxiety, when I experience concern, that is like my Holy Spirit cue to pray the thing. And then I, I pray it again and I pray it again. And it becomes this pattern in my life. Your concerns will struggle to consume you if they are communicated constantly. But you cannot pray it once and then quit. I'm going to say something that's going to freak some of you out, but that's okay. Um, Jesus, when he was experiencing anxiety in the garden the night before he was crucified, to the point where he was sweat drops of blood, he went and he prayed to his father. And he told his father, this is what I'm concerned about. This is what I'm concerned about. This is what I'm concerned about. Then he went back to his disciples. 
And then he went back to his father. This is what I'm concerned about. This is what I'm Then he went to his disciples. Then he went back again. This is what I'm concerned about. This is what. And if Jesus himself had to keep taking his concern back to his father several times, that should be the pattern that marks our lives as well. And then he uses the word to praise. Um, this is the most counterintuitive invitation when we are anxious. But how beautiful is this? When you find yourself concerned with what might go wrong, Paul says, praise God for what he's done right. Praise God for the things that are right. Give God praise for the ways that he's shown up. Give God praise for the ways that he has answered prayer in the past. Give God praise for the fact that you're still alive and some of the things you feared for years and years and years still haven't caught up with you. Now, some of them might but even in that, he's shown up in this way or that way or the other way. There is something powerful when this playlist becomes a praise list and I start to counter what could go wrong with what God has done and how good God is in the grand scheme of things. And even that is not something you just think. That is something you ought to say. In fact, I was saying to one of our teammates between services because something went wrong. I'm like, okay. Well, I praise God for the times that this thing has gone right. I need to start this practice of praising him in those moments, in those places. And I'm confident that something starts to shift. Something starts to shake. Like when Paul and Silas were locked up in the Philippian prison, and of all times, they start to sing praise, hymns to God, and the foundations start to shake, and chains start to break. I believe something starts to shift when you defy your concern with praise doesn't mean you stop feeling it. It's not so much about feeling, it's about choosing that even in this, I choose to declare you are good, even though I don't necessarily feel your goodness right now, I call on the ways you've been good in my past and I declare it to you, which is one of the reasons I'd encourage you to make it a practice of being a church and praising God, especially when you are going through a difficult time. That tends to be the time we remove ourselves from the context of praise, from the house of praise. I'm like, no, defy the devil and be in the house of God and say he is still good in this season even though I don't feel it and even though I'm struggling with this. I love the power of praise that we are invited to. And then he says, present, present, present. This word is the idea of making a case. This is simply telling God, what are you asking me to do? See, because in your mind... There is this playlist of all the things or the thing that could go terribly wrong, the feared outcome. And God says, come tell me, what is the desired outcome? What is it that you want me to do with your concern? Tell me what you want me to do. And I wonder if for some of us, if we're honest, we wouldn't admit the fact that I can't remember the last time I communicated my consuming thoughts to God. I can't remember the last time I even put words to what is it that I desire you to do. I can't remember the last time I strung two days together of telling him over and over again. And yet that's what Paul invites us to do. And then God gives a promise. Um, Philippians 4 verse 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition and thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I love this promise. God says, I will make you a deal. And I'm telling you, do not walk out of this room today without taking the deal that's on the table. God says, you bring your prayers, I'll bring my peace. You bring your prayers, I'll bring my peace. I'm making you a deal right now. Do you want it? You keep bringing those prayers and I'll keep showing up with my peace. Anxiety by nature is this deep restlessness. How amazing that God would promise the very thing the giant comes to rob us of. Peace, peace, that supernatural uh, ability to, to say, like, I don't know what tomorrow holds. But come on, old school, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know he's good, and I know he's got me, and I know he's got my best in mind, and I know he's got my kids, and I know he's got my finances, and I know he's got the events of this country under control. So good night, I'm going to sleep. The 
the peace of God. You can't pay for it. You can't work to earn it. You can't figure it out. You can't fix it. This is the deal on the table. You bring your prayer. You bring your plea, and I will bring my peace. And the world right now, can we agree, needs a dose of the peace that God promises to pour out on his church if they would come to him in our seasons of concern. And don't you just love the way it describes this peace? This peace um, isn't just... It doesn't just start to consume. I love that. It's the peace that consumes the very thing anxiety attempts to do. It will consume, but I love the fact that it will also protect. It's the kind of peace that stands like a a military unit at the entrance to your heart and your mind, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. It will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. I love that thought. And so when that thought comes up, up to your mind and knocks on the door and says, hey, I'm here to remind her about how things didn't work out last time and things could go badly, peace is like, "Mm -mm," pat you down. You are carrying contraband that does not belong belong in this heart, does not belong in this mind, get out. I want some of that peace. I want that TSA peace. Like, pat that thought down before it has access to my system. I love what the peace promises to do. This is a war, church. Uh, it's something we're going to have to be in And then we'll find ourselves thinking thoughts and we get to the place where anxiety starts to consume again. And then we have to start the practice again of of saying those prayers and and saying those prayers continually and, and telling God what it is we're asking him to do. And God every time promises to deliver peace. This is not going to happen once. This is going to happen over and over again if we bring our end of the equation to the table and pray our concerns. I've got to say one more thing really quickly, and then, um, man, we're going to just invite our leaders to come up and be available if folks want to pray and want to agree and, and want to enter into this promise with our God. But I want to say something about practice. Practice. Um, Come on, Alan Iverson, practice. Practice. Um, I think it bears noting that steps towards victory over anxiety are not just about what you pray, but also about what you practice. Um... We stop reading often a little early. Let me read verse 8, Philippians chapter 4. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Consider such things. Mull over such things. The other day... um, I walked up to our refrigerator at home, I opened the door, and I looked in there, and I was looking for, now feel free to mistake me for a healthy person, I was looking for zucchini. Um, I looked around, and there was no zucchini in our refrigerator. And I was a little bit aggravated by this fact. Um, And um, the reason there was no zucchini in the refrigerator is because I'd finished the zucchini, and I had failed to replace zucchini. So there was no zucchini in the refrigerator. And I was really just a little bit on the upset side of life. And you know what's fascinating? Is uh, our minds work in many ways like my refrigerator at home works. Um, I can only get out of it what I put into it. When I open the door, I can't expect to find zucchini if I didn't put zucchini in the fridge. This is what Paul is saying about the practice of protecting your peace. Come on. For many of us, what we stock in our minds, it's all social media. It is all Netflix. It is all Amazon Prime. It is all about what this person is saying and the rumors with this Kardashian and what's happening on this news channel. And that's what we stuck in our minds. And when you are tired and when you are hurting and you open the refrigerator, you will get out of the refrigerator what you put into it. 
And so Paul would say, I'm going to read this one more time. Whatever is true, stock that. Whatever is noble, stock that. What is right, what is pure, what is lovely, what is admirable, what is excellent, what is praiseworthy. Think about such things and you will find anxiety has very little to consume. But peace is constantly being perpetuated. Don't just pray for peace, practice for peace. Peace. We live in an era in which, come on, we take time to stock the minds, but seldom do we sit down. When's the last time you sat down and said, I'm going to binge on something really, really good so that it's in my mind? And yet that is a powerful invitation. Next week, we're going to talk about uh, mental health struggles, but here's the thing. Before I can start to even talk about a mental health struggle, I've got to take my intentional steps of what's going into my mind by practice and what it is I am praying on a regular basis. But church, God promises peace. His church should be a place that is full of people who are struggling and wrestling but enjoying and experiencing peace. And ultimately, Jesus is our peace. And so I pray, Father, that you would do something in our worlds and in our minds that allow us to start this practice of turning our worry to words and sharing them with you. You have promised, and we want to experience every promise that you've made, believing it is yes in the person of Jesus Christ. So give us the courage, give us the grace to take the steps that you've invited us to take and meet us in this place. And then meet us again down the road. And then meet us again down the road. And I pray, Lord, that you would just rest in this place with a supernatural peace even this morning. I pray that somebody would experience peace maybe for the first time simply because they voiced what it is that's been plaguing them. And they praised you for how good you've been. And you showed up in powerful ways. We believe you for that today and in the days to come. And then may we be those who carry peace to a world that is so restless. In Jesus' name, amen.